Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 356, featuring an interview with Mr. Don Wilkins, the developer of a game called Stellar Tactics. Now this is a sci-fi turn-based strategic or tactical uh, role-playing game with a lot of depth, a uh, procedural generated universe, and uh, options for ground missions as well as uh, stuff to do in space. It just is a really ambitious project that is coming along quite nicely. Uh, I would have been happy to interview Don just to talk about this, but as, as it turns out, he's got a really nice resume. He's worked for companies like Surtec, uh, 3DO, as well as Sierra. And I really uh, wanted in this video to get into his uh, history to talk about some of this early stuff he's worked on, like Wizardry Gold, for example, and I know you guys want to hear all about it. Anyway, lots of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Don Wilkins. All right, folks, I am here with Don Wilkins. He is the founder of Maverick, uh, Maverick Games, a company that's developing Stellar Tactics. And this is a game that uh, I think is really going to appeal to uh, all you Matt Chatters out there. It's a party-based RPG game with a sci uh, science fiction setting. It's got turn-based strategic combat on the ground and also open-world space exploration in a procedurally generated universe. Uh, however, Don's no newcomer to the industry. As a matter of fact, uh, very far from the case. His uh, roots go all the way back to 1980, and he's worked on some great projects uh, for companies like Surtec, 3DO, and Sierra, which I'm sure you're familiar with if you're watching my videos. Uh, I know you're very excited to hear from him, so uh, how are you doing today, Don? Doing well. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, before we go uh, into Stellar Tactics, I want to delve into this history, because you've got some really fascinating uh, stuff in your history. Uh, first of all, I would encourage everyone to uh, listen to Shane Play's interview with you. He did that recently and uh, actually put us in touch, so thank you to Shane for that. Um, but one of the things that you mentioned in, the, in that interview was that you worked on a game that you called Star Wreck uh, back in 1980. And this is a, a pretty unusual game. A lot of uh, younger folks probably would uh, be really fascinated to hear this about this game. So can you tell us a little bit about the Star Wreck? Sure. Yeah, so... The deal was uh, back in high school, there was this this closet way in the back of the school, and not many people knew about it, but um, you could fit about four people in there, and they actually had computer terminals. And it was uh, an incredibly geeky place to hang out in high school. And there were about four or six, maybe ten max that ever really uh, involved ourselves there. But um, one of the things you could do is uh, – they were all kind of like type terminals with paper feeds and you would take a phone and you dial the university number and you take the phone and you plug it into this sort of uh, phone receptacle thing and it would dial up and connect to the university computer over modem. And um, basically on that server, they had all kinds of stuff, but um, there were a few games. There was Zork, I think, and a couple of other things. And, um, one of them was sort of a Star Trek clone that was really cool, and that kind of piqued my interest. So um, I believe the language that I learned there was BASIC, and uh, they, they had a copy of BASIC on the server, and I just started coding up this little space adventure game where you could uh, type in text commands like, um, uh, I think I think some of it was similar to uh, proceed to sector um, 10 comma 10 and you a couple seconds later you know the 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 printer would start typing out sort of a message to you saying you engage your warp drive and you're pushed back in your seat as the engines engage and um it was it was all text-based um sort of exploration it was on a really small scale and i think you know there may have been five or seven people who had ever heard of it so um you know, it didn't go anywhere at the time. People were just trying to figure out how to make money with games, really, you know, and, and it was just kind of fun stuff to do. And it was a far cry from what we do now because what we're into now is, is incredibly visual. And um, it's been a long, long time since that text-based sort of thing caught on. But I have seen it here and there that there, there are some people who still like to pick that up and play it. And, um, 
think it inspires a lot of imagination. So, yeah, you still see some of uh, some folks doing rogue, yeah, like classic rogue style. Where they ask you characters, and there's plenty of interactive uh, fiction yeah. contests. It just amazes me because I'm sure you guys are having a really a lot of fun, even with that with that hardware. And can you? Call, I guess graphics. I mean, you could call it graphics. So. Yeah, they would print out. You could do you know dot matrix graphics um, things that were like um, one of the things you could do is just type map and it would just print a map and it'd sort of show a. I think um, we used an a- asterisk for various systems and then other characters on the keyboard for your position and. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there were other things you know like um, we tried to put a combat system in. And uh, it was really super simple, like a ship would randomly engage you and, and you'd just fire at it and give you some text numbers and stuff like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't a really big deal, but it was a lot of fun to put together. And um, before I left high school, I printed out all the code and stuck it down in the bottom of a box and eventually lost it somewhere. Oh, no. So, yeah, well, you know, it's okay. I could have framed it, I guess, but it wasn't very pretty to look at. So, <laughs> yeah, you hear, you hear guys complaining about, uh, oh, I'm only getting sixty frames per second, or <laughs> they look at the anti-aliasing on that. You're like, you realize you could be looking at an asterisk, you know, that's printing out on a dot matrix. Uh, it's just come such such a long way from that. And you know, the funny thing is, the evolution of transitioning from that to where we are today is feels fairly seamless i mean i have a lot of memories of going through you know four colors no colors four colors 16 32 256 16 bit 32 bit and all the resolutions in between on these screens and it's uh, a lot of change well fill in uh, if you'll fill fill in some gaps for me here don because you're doing i'm well, what happened in between this uh, Star Wreck game and, and founding your own studio in 1993? Yeah, it's it, there's a long haul in between, and it's it's interesting because I never really considered it when I made the game. I never considered computers to be a career at the time. So I went off and did a lot of things. I mean, I lived by the beach, so I'd do as little work as I could for about seven or eight years, did a little bit of college, surfed a lot. A beach bum. Yeah, I was just ser- a very serious beach bum. I mean, I would <laughs> I would basically work through a job and save all my money and then, you know, wait until I just had a little bit of food left in the cupboard and go out and work some more. But um, I did that uh, for seven or seven years or so. Um, got into uh, construction for a while, then moved on to sales. And then um, I picked up a Tandy, uh, one of those old – uh, Tandies, I think they had 256 colors. Forget the exact model. Um, and uh, bought a game. I, I think the actual game I bought at the time was Sentinel Worlds. Okay, and this was a sci fi game again, you know, going back to my roots of sci fi from the beginning. And I read the box and I thought, wow, that really sounds kind of like Star Wreck. That sounds cool. I'll, I'll give this a try plugged in the old um, floppy disk and I would sit I would sit literally for five minutes waiting for area transitions as this thing was just grinding on that disk and I had no problem doing that so I had a ton of fun with that game and I thought well I know how to write basic it, it's got to be the same so I started kind of geeking around on my little tandy and doing some graphic things and um decided, well, you know, this is really fun, and these computers are going places, and that was right when the clone PC market was starting to kick in pretty heavily all over the country. And from there, I ended up selling computers and doing corporate computer sales, and then um, saved up a bunch of money. And then it was really interesting. Um, Then I played Wizardry 7, and I decided, okay, this is so cool that I just have to make games now. And it took me a while, um, but I put together a small studio doing some multimedia work in the early 90s. And um, that's, that's where um, you know, I just made a huge career change and stepped away from sales and marketing. And um, the other things I was doing got serious. Was that the first Wizardry game you had played, Wizardry 7? It was. And then um, 
I think I went to Wizardry 6 after that and played that immediately. And I didn't go back much further for a while. I mean, I, I, I kind of got, you know, I, I really wanted the graphics part of this. It, it tr- totally intrigued me. And um, so, you know, after that, it was just game after game. I just started absorbing everything I could. Um, started up um, a small company, myself and one other person to start. We did a lot of multimedia conversion and hybrid discs and things of that nature. This is when you were uh, working on HyperCard stuff, HyperCard yeah, stack? Yeah. That's a, a Macintosh of, thing, right? It was. It's interesting. So, for example, um, we would get we would get a project that was initially built in HyperCard. And what I what people wanted was now they wanted it on Windows. So what I'd do is I'd take Visual Basic and I'd convert the HyperCard using Visual Basic and then build a hybrid disk. And um, the hybrid disk would plug into a Mac or a PC and um, – People would be able to, um, you know, it was one disk because people wanted to cut down distribution costs and things of that nature. But there was a lot of content on the Mac that had never been seen on the PC at the time. So it was a nifty little business for a while. Um, but it was kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi- HyperCard. I remember when this was really getting getting hyped, I think, is what the, they used to make Mist with and yeah, a few other, yeah. I guess, some of their earlier pro- uh, projects. It was fairly powerful and um, really was designed to um, deliver um, quality media, you know, the things that people hadn't seen before. Um, add, add graphics to text and just um, really people got pretty creative with it for a while. So, yeah. Hypercard. It's, <laughs> Hypercard. <laughs> you know, it, it just seems so... It, it just seems so ancient now, you know, compared to um, what's out there now. I mean, I can't remember that, when the word multimedia just sounded so, you know, hip. I know. And I say it now and I feel ancient. You know, people <laughs> go multi what? <laughs> multimedia? Really? Yeah, it's funny how it's basically still have the basic concept. They keep renaming it to different. Uh, what was it now? Digital arts or something like that? Yeah, they just they just keep rebranding it. It means the same thing. It's it's really just um, taking content and 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 delivering it. Um, but uh, you know things have changed a lot, and and nobody could see sort of the things that are going on now with social media and content delivery and bandwidth and. And I could just keep going like RAM, you know, eight gigs of RAM. Whoa. People don't even think about that anymore. That's like a ton of storage. <laughs> yeah, so there's probably people, kids out there that have never seen a floppy disk, I'm sure. It's possible. I keep one around just so I can, you know, say, hey, this is what it used to be on. <laughs> but but I find that that doesn't go over very well. People are like, <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> So sometime around, I guess around this time, I'm trying to think of the year this must have been, uh, you sent, you made a demo of a game that you wanted to show to Surtech, who, as you said, these these were the guys making your favorite uh, games, and you really wanted to work for them. Uh, so could you tell me a little bit about this demo that you made, and, and what was it that sure. impressed the guys that, and gals at uh, Surtech? Yeah, it was a little bit different. Again, sci-fi. What I did is, um, in 3D Studio Max, I built out an entire scene. And in this scene, there were a number of doors that would open and close. It was very sci-fi-like and um, all kinds of you know stuff glued to the walls. Like in Aliens, if you look really closely, they've got some really weird stuff glued to the walls. I don't know if you ever noticed, but it's all been paint, spray-painted silver colors and stuff. So I kind of looked at the movie and said, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting that you can just take these objects and create uh, what they officially call it is greeble. Greeble. Anyway. Greeble. Greeble is like it, it takes simple walls and turns them into epic sci-fi fantasy sort of coolness. Yeah. And yeah. Anyway, so this whole thing was set up and you'd kind of walk through uh, various corridors from um, a place where you'd landed your ship and um, in, eventually into a little room and there was a voice that was talking to you, sort of a, a sci-fi voice. But The technology itself was interesting in that um, what I did is I took um, a series of waypoints and filmed as 
um, the first person camera was moving through that environment. And then what I did is I took the video and I indexed it. And by indexing, that means like from frame 20 to 24 is me moving through this location. From frame 24 to 35 is me taking my next step. So you'd basically just kind of zoom through this area and move forward like you would in uh, Wizardry 7, for example. You know, as you move, you just kind of get that next frame. This is a lot smoother, though, and it was really high res. And the reason I went there is at the time, most games were 320 by 240 screen resolution. Absolute max was 640, 480, maybe 800 by 600. So what this did is it gives gave you a a really high high detail um, first person experience traveling through this environment, and um, there was audio associated with it and a couple other interactive elements. So that was basically the demo, and the idea there was to show them that there's a different way to do this. You don't just have to, you don't have to use stills. You can do things that are a little bit more high resolution, even though the video cards aren't really designed for full 3D yet. So. Um, so I delivered that to Surtech and they got back. I think it was Robin Matthews. Do you um, know people there or you just mail this, this just <laughs> to whom it may concern? <laughs> it's something you learn in sales. Sometimes you just have to cold call and get out there and talk to people. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I was kind of annoying too. It wasn't really just m me sending them a random disc. There was a phone call, a follow-up call, another follow-up call. I was, I was pretty annoying at the time. But they liked it and they got back to me. I'm trying to think back who it was exactly. I think it was Robin, but a few folks down there had taken a look at it, including Linda Curry and Ian, um, Ian Curry. And um, so shortly after that, I ended up traveling up to uh, Microsoft had this really big um, sort of developers conference. And I believe it may have been the first one. It was up in San Jose, if I remember right. And they were pitching WinG. And WinG was this drawing surface API uh, that was the precursor for DirectX, which is what everybody uses now on the PC for the most part, other than OpenGL is the, is the other major API. Um, and I met them there, and we talked, and we got along well. And uh, soon after that, I was working on uh, Wizardry Gold. So... I, mean, I was thinking earlier. You're, uh, I got some. Uh, you're in some pretty good company here with other Surtech uh, veterans. I've had uh, Robert Surtech on, Robert Woodhead, Brenda Romero. Yeah, I'm not sure if they who all was there uh, while you were yeah. there. I would like to hear just a little, a little bit about just kind of what what was it like there? You know, at Surtech was it sure. was it fun going into work or was <laughs> were they working you to the Honestly, bone? Or? I, I was so so excited to have an opportunity um, to work with them because I knew. I had a lot to learn about the industry at the time. I just didn't know enough. I, I didn't know enough to run a studio at the time because I didn't understand the inner workings of how things were done. So they, when they made an offer, I, I accepted immediately and came out. They were up in upstate New York in Ogdensburg, which is a very small town, uh, right on the St. Lawrence River. And um, so that was the publishing side of the business. They also had a studio up in Ottawa, Canada, which was the development studio. And um, moving there was really weird for me because I'd never lived in the snow in my life. So here is this you know, Southern California guy uh, traveling to upstate New York doing exactly what he wanted to do. So I was, I was just on top of the world. The whole experience was just fantastic. And um, initially, I went up there and worked uh, a couple of months wrapping up Wizardry Gold just to see if I liked the area. But to answer your question, it's a very small town. There are pubs on almost every corner, small kind of little bars and stuff, and it's just a different world. you know. Summer's hot and steamy. Winter is absolutely freezing cold. I mean, like ice storms and other kind of weird stuff. But you go into the office, and um, you know there are games and awards everywhere on the walls. You'd you'd walk through a little area, and, and Norm Ciratek's office was this this big office on the right, 
and Rob's, if I remember right, was this big office on the left, and you just keep going into the back area with the little conference room. And then a bunch of small offices there where um, Rob and Matthews worked. Uh, Brenda Romero worked there when I first arrived. She she eventually, shortly after that, moved up to work in Ogdensburg on on Wizardry Eight as uh, the writer and and you know a designer. She was great. She was great to work. With. She was a lot of fun to work with, and everybody had a great attitude. They loved what they were doing. They loved making games. Um, it was business. But they were having fun, and you can't beat that. You can't beat that to make a living. And um, I just had a great time there. So, how long did it take you to, for the surreal nature of it to wear off? And like, well, I'm, I'm actually here at Surtech. <laughs> you know, it it really didn't. Honestly, the the entire time I was there, it was just it was just great. And I have to say, you know, the saddest thing in the world was um, when they had to close the office, and you know, they decided to, to end the publishing side of the business and continue on with development. So I think, um, um, you know, that was the only sad time I remember being there. And, you know, we at the time, um, I think, you know, Rob and Norm had a plan to, to try to grow into the marketplace a little more than they had been in the past. So we picked up we picked up some additional games um, from other publishers and distributed those. But in the end, I think the retail channel was just too difficult to compete in. It really was. It was just a really weird time. So. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next time. I've got a, another segment of uh, historical stuff before we jump into the Stellar Tactics stuff. Uh, we need to get through the uh, 3DO and the Sierra years, and he's got a lot of insights into uh, what it was like working at those companies as they were basically uh, falling apart at the seams. So I definitely want to stay tuned for that. The story gets a lot more dramatic. You got a little taste of that here at the end uh, with Surtech. So uh, if that appealed to you, you'll definitely want to stick around for part two. And then part three will focus in on Stellar Tactics. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of my show. Matt Chat could not do this without your help. Uh, you really are important to me, and I appreciate your support. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, and for whatever reason have been putting it off, please go on to the uh, Patreon site. Uh, there's a link in the show notes to that. Uh, you can also support the show on PayPal. Just go to the mattchat.us site, or just tell your friends about it on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, whatever it is you can do uh, for the show, I really appreciate it. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Well, the biggest news, at least uh, for me, is that Civ 6 is out. Uh, you know, I've gotten a couple of texts from you guys, uh, notices me playing it on Steam. Uh, I guess that people have some problems with the game. I haven't, I've played, probably played it about eight hours so far, and I really enjoy the uh, learning the new rules and everything. Uh, I haven't seen anything that uh, I didn't like so far, but uh, maybe that might change, you know, as I play it more. Uh, a couple things that are interesting about it. Uh, one, of course, is that Sean Bean is doing the quotations. And of course, uh, Leonard Nimoy did the ones for, uh, what was it, four, I think, uh, that Leonard Nimoy did. And you know, how are you ever gonna top that, right? Uh, but I really am a big fan of Sean Bean, even going back to the Sharps uh, movies. So a uh, really good choice. And I just, you know, I love quotes. So uh, that was all pretty cool. Uh, just pretty big changes with the, uh, the city layouts. You have this, these things called districts now and some other changes. I might, you know, there's probably like a thousand reviews of it up already, so I probably won't bother doing that. But uh, it, it is different enough from Civ V uh, to uh, feel like a sequel. You know, I, I would say I would put I would say that's uh, my opinion so far. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, some other news from Indie Retro News. You know, we were, I was talking to a Don here about 3D graphics and how far they've come, and uh, it just so happens somebody has. Uh, done a remake of Frontier Elite 2's intro sequence using the Elite Dangerous game engine. 
And th now this might be old news for some people, but it's the first time I'm hearing about it. I went and watched this uh, video and was really impressed. It's a Fusion DCA. Fusion DCA is the one who made this remake. Uh, anyway, I posted a link to that. Go check it out. If you're an Elite fan, that is. Uh, and then finally, there's a little update here from Game Banshee. Uh, this is on the uh, one of the best named CRPGs ever, Dungeon Rats. Uh, that's, remember, that's from the uh, Age of Decadence guys. Uh, apparently, they now have an official release date, and it's uh, pretty coming up here pretty quick. It's November 4th. Uh, so I was thinking this was a ways out, but I guess not. Uh, so exciting news about that. Uh, also, uh, when you go read about this on Game Man Banshee, be sure to check out their Baldur's Gate uh, guide. Uh, they, you know, they had that forever, right? But they've just made a huge overhaul, bring in all the enhanced edition content, updated the interface and everything. It's really cool. Uh, it's the one that I use uh, when I play Baldur's Gate. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. Uh, now, what about that drink of the week? All right, so keeping up with our Halloween theme here, I've got a another one of these horrific Jones sodas. This is a lemon drop dead soda. It will haunt you forever. A scary, delicious treat from the folks at Jones Soda. Okay, and then they got the same, uh, looks like the same write-up they had on their other scary soda, so I won't bother repeating that. But anyway, it is a Jones Soda, and these are pretty easy to find. I think I got this maybe from a world market uh, one of those world market stores, so hopefully you can find one near you uh, if it turns out to be good. So uh, anyway, let's get this uh, lemon drop dead soda open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, lemon drop dead soda here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Uh, and I, uh, I have to say, I'm not really impressed with the <laughs> aroma coming off of this thing. Uh, I don't know if it's, in t it's supposed to smell like uh, it's kind of a sulfuric uh, smell. <laughs> or maybe this uh, bottle has gone bad somehow. But, you know, when you first smell it, it's kind of nice and uh, lemony. But then you get this sort of sulfur-like uh, smell. It's definitely not uh, pleasant. Uh, again, considering it's supposed to be a horror-themed soda, maybe that's, you know, supposed to be part of it. Uh, I don't know, but... It's not doing much uh, for me as far as wanting to drink it, but uh, I'll go ahead anyway. Uh, yeah, that's it's kind of sour and tart, and then you get that same sort of sulfur-like thing you were smelling now it's <laughs> in your throat. Uh, really not a pleasant uh, beverage. I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, this one is just rancid. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, given the benefit of a doubt, maybe my bottle uh, got contaminated. Let's see, DB5217 1352A, drink by 5217. Uh, so, should still be good, I guess, but anyway, this is awful stuff. Man, I'm going to go 0 out of 5 on this. I uh, definitely don't recommend it. Uh, stay away. <laughs> stay well away. Uh, I think that unless you uh, want something pretty much disgusting, uh, stay away from the lemon drop dead soda. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Civ 6, as I said, Sean Bean's doing all the uh, quotations this time. And, uh, like with any Civ game, there's really great quotes. I mean, another reason I like the Civ series, uh, not one of the biggest reasons, but something I definitely appreciate about it are all those great quotes. Uh, so here's one uh, from the new game. I think it was also in the, in the older ones. But anyway, here it goes. This is from Will Rogers. When you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. <laughs> See you guys next week.
women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government.